Um, the next big step uh, for you guys would be the signing of cap, uh, capital in the 80s um, mm -hmm. for Helix, right? Because mm -hmm. from then you were just kind of gigging. You had two independent albums. That's correct. And then uh, you got signed uh, with capital. That, mm -hmm. um, that was 80s was a, was a great uh, decade for you guys. It should have been bigger, but it was great, right? <laughs> well, you know, hindsight's always twenty twenty vision. We were signed in 1983, I believe, to Capitol Records, No Rest of the Wicked. We had released two independent albums, and they had sold about 15,000 copies each. Unheard of nowadays, mm -hmm. really. We were one of the few Canadian, well, we were the first Canadian band, really, that I knew of that actually did their own album. It was unheard of back then. But... We were a persistent bunch, and we decided after every record company turned us down just not to take no for an answer. And so we recorded Breaking Loose in 1977 on my uh, grandmother's money, my parents' money, uh, my manager's money, his parents' uh, money. And I think at that time it cost us $26,000. It was quite a large That's chunk a lot of, of money back then. Uh, well, it's a large amount of money now. Mm -hmm. And... We got distribution through little distribution companies in the United States and Canada. I think uh, the one in Canada, Treble Clef, went, went belly up, and we had all sorts of problems. But with every album we released, we gained a little bit more knowledge, and we kept pressing forward. And more importantly, it was a single to the record companies that we wouldn't give up. And we were gaining a, a very uh, steady, healthy following through the uh, bar circuit, especially in Canada. We were starting to branch out in the United States. The uh, um, album in uh, 1977, rather, gained a lot of attention in the state of Texas. Yeah, it led to our first tour down there through Joe Anthony. Um, and then the next album became a number one import in uh, England, White Lace and Black Leather, and eventually we get signed to uh, Capital EMI. Um now, there's uh, something that's been said that you were marketed to Capital. They didn't pick you up right away. No. But then they decided metal was breaking at the time. Mm -hmm. Let's let's get the guys some, some black leather studs. And no, we uh, decided that. You decided that. Mm -hmm. And then you were marketed as a heavy metal band. Um, that's true. Now, do, do you find yourself actually as more of a heavy metal band or as a hard rock band? I mean, how, you know. Well, what the hell's the difference? Yeah. Well, really, uh, b back in the day, I think that uh, we decided to go with uh, the the metal and the leather more so to get a harder look to our image. We felt that as a band, we needed to have not only the music together, we needed to have the clothes together, we needed to have the image together, and uh, because competition was just too f uh, fierce, mm -hmm. uh, wasn't good enough to be good. We we needed to be excellent in all fields, and we had a real uh, mentality in the band that we weren't competing against a band at the end of the street. We were competing on an international level against the Judas Priests and the ACDCs of the world, and the, and we needed to kick it up a notch. So everything that was involved with the band, from videos to the recording to the music to the the, the look of the band, the photo sessions, um, we tried to make it as best as we could with when the money we had. And then when you went on, when you did the tours, you did a lot of great tours with some great bands. Yes. They were all pretty heavy bands. I mean, uh, B Black Sabbath, <laughs> um, you know, uh, Motorhead. Yeah. You know, those, those guys are... We were a pop band compared weird. to those bands, yeah. But um, I, I think you fit, you fit well in there. I also read that Black Sabbath, apparently the one lineup that you guys did a, uh, some shows with, uh -huh. you did their final show as a lineup as as their lineup i mean they they packed it in after with ian gillen yeah with with ian gillen and um in fact i think they had a big argument that night um, and the road crew nearly lynched us so yeah so then that is true that was the last show of that you know why tour. They ne nearly lynched us uh no but we're gonna find out right now that's right because after the show uh i think brent and paul were throwing picks out to the, the we were at second floor eh? right right and there's all these fans, this mob of fans down the street where we were decking around. We were throwing picks out to the chicks down the street, right? And pretty soon more and more people gathered and the road crew was trying to carry the gear out and they flipped out. And this great big gorilla of a friggin' road guy came up and he said, look at you mother so-and-sos. Mm -hmm. He says, uh, one more pick? I'll take that pick and shove up your ass. 
And that was the uh, that was end the end of, of it. Pic- that was the end of the tour. And antics. Nice. Um, did you guys get to, get to hang around with Ian? Like you ended up actually. Uh, we actually went to a party one night over in Europe with Ian Gillen when we toured with Ian Gillen in nineteen. Uh, 89. In fact, right. the first time I ever drank Jägermeister, when I drank, I don't drink anymore. Uh, but the uh, first time I ever drank Jägermeister was in East Berlin with Ian Gillen. Wow. He came back in our dressing room and uh, he had this stuff and we said, what's that? And he says, it's Jägermeister. And we go, oh yeah, give us a drink. <laughs> um, with the Black Sabbath shows, did, did you hang around with uh, Ian and... Um, no? No. no not, not back that then. Not we were riding in the back of a truck on top of the gear and a, a sheet of plywood. Mm. Fritz had something uh, pretty funny to say about Bev Bevan, I think, in in, in your book. I, I read it as well. <laughs> he, I think he called him a, a sissy pants drummer. Yeah. But Bev Bevan was from ELO, right? Like, what was he doing with Black Sabbath? That was like super mismatch, don't you think? Uh, yeah, it was. I think it was uh, the management. Just, like, put our Garfunkel on guitar or yeah, something. You nice. know? Like, come on. Okay, and so yeah, what else is really good? Um, Motorhead. Uh, you guys, that was a great tour. That was a great tour. tour. Brent didn't like that so much. I don't think Brent got along with Lemmy. Well, I think I think Brent took Lemmy the wrong way because Lemmy had a very dry sense of humor. I remember one time going to do an interview with uh, Lemmy, and we were asked to do an anti-drug commercial. I thought, well, this is going to be good. An anti-drug commercial coming from Lemmy, like Mr. Speed Freak. And uh, he gets in there, and he pulls up the mic, and goes, oh, I'll to tell you, all you kids out there, done drugs that all my friends that done drugs either dead or they're gonna die so don't do drugs kids that's lemmy over and out and i thought cool 